Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give this paper. Uh, just a few small uh, tidbits. Uh, I, uh, you know, the way I was Korea Development Institute is organized is very similar to how think tanks are organized in India. Uh, in India, there's a think tank called NIPFP, which does uh, policy work for the finance ministry, even though it's disjoint from the finance ministry, it's government funded. Uh, there's a graduate school uh, like the graduate school of KDI, which produces master students in public policy and economics. Uh, I've also been associated with the institute in India for some of the uh, regulatory work that they are planning. In fact, in India, they are setting up a systemic risk council for the first time, uh, starting sometime in fall, and uh, I'm, I'm talking to them a little bit about some things we've learned over the last year. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, in a similar setting, but in a different country. Uh, okay, so this is joint work with uh, Lassa Peterson, Thomas Philippon, and Matt Richardson. It's called Measuring Systemic Risk. Uh, our objective in this paper uh, is very simple. Um, we wanted to develop a theory of uh, systemic risk externalities uh, from which uh, one would essentially derive some optimal taxation scheme uh, and ideally the goal was that that will actually tell you what is it that you should be looking for when you think about charging an institution for its systemic risk. So at the outset let me uh, mention one important point which is that uh, you know there are two ways in which the uh, research on regulation works. One kind of research on regulation uh, is really interested in providing a very micro foundation for what kind of distortions are there, what might be the systemic risk externalities. Uh, these papers have very valuable insights, but sometimes it's hard to take them directly into the policy uh, uh, space. Of course, this doesn't mean that the papers are not right, it's just that the world is very complex and we can only do so much in a single model. Uh, in, so we wanted to not take that approach. We wanted to take an approach which was in which the modeling was sufficiently simple, even if somewhat reduced form, so that in the end, whatever we came out with could actually be something that we could use in practice. Of course, you can be the judge as to whether what we have come up with can be used in practice or not. But at least that was the intention. Now, needless to say, there is some compromises that arise as a result of this. There are many interesting questions we won't be able to answer, uh, but we think that uh, the measure I'm going to propose may have some usefulness, uh, if not directly to calculate a tax for systemic institutions, at least as an input into the regulatory supervision and macroprudential process. So uh, I think as a number of our introductory speakers uh, have told us, the traditional approach has relied on firm level risk. The idea has been to limit the risk of individual bank. Uh, when you think about that, the challenge for an individual firm or a micro supervisor of an institution is to really have detailed knowledge about activities inside the firm, impose some risk limits. Typically, this seems to be done through value at risk. Uh, maybe some concentration limits, uh, there might be some capital requirements on this institution, etc. There's a sense in which though this microprudential approach ignores uh, systemic risk. Now, let me take a step back though. There's a sense, there's one setting in which the microprudential approach maps into a macroprudential approach, which is if all institutions are exactly identical in which in that case regulating the risk of an individual institution well must be by definition equal to regulating the risk of the whole system. In fact, if you see the foundations of the Basel capital weights, there's a nice paper by Michael Gordy in Journal of Financial Intermediation. It is actually based on that premise that all financial institutions are essentially holding identical, extremely well diversified portfolios of loans uh, in the economy. But as we've seen in this crisis, uh, due to management choices, due to choices of different doing different businesses, due to richness of the kind of financial products, markets, loans, etc. that get made, institutions are not exactly identical, they are different. Uh, and therefore thinking that regulating the risk of an individual institution is equivalent to regulating the risk of the system 
uh, doesn't follow necessarily because of this heterogeneity. So <coughs> we are going to therefore allow for this possibility that different institutions may be different uh, and introduce a systemic risk friction and ask the question who is contributing how much to the systemic risk of the economy. Uh, so, <coughs> a simple motivation for our theoretical framework uh, can be based on the idea of the stress tests that the Federal Reserve System conducted in the United States. So, in, on February 25th, uh, the Fed uh, and the other institutions of the Federal Reserve System announced that the 19 largest banking holding companies uh, will be subjecting them to a stress test, uh, following which they will assess under these stress scenarios, there were two scenarios, one moderate and one adverse based on uh, GDP contraction, house price collapse, unemployment rates, etc. Those were mapped into losses on different kinds of assets on the portfolios of these banks. Supervisors engaged partly in micro supervision of each bank. They got some inputs from banks as to what their losses would be in these scenarios. But then there was a macro prudential aspect to it, which was to horizontally aggregate this information, ensure some consistency of losses, assumptions, uh, default rates, assumptions on various assets that were out there. Now, it's very clear from this exercise that institutions are not the same. Otherwise, they, could, they should have just gone and supervised one institution. So nine out of 19 had enough capital, even in these adverse scenarios. So the goal was to ensure that even under the losses that arise in these stress tests, the institution should have a 4% tier one uh, capital buffer uh, based at the end of it. So nine of the 19 had enough capital whereas the other 10 needed to raise a total of $75 billion. So there were two, two key points we wanted to make. There's an aggregate shortfall in the scenario of $75 billion. We are not asking the question, what is the risk of an individual institution? We are asking the question, what is the risk of the institution in a macroeconomic stress scenario out there? Uh, and not all banks are undercapitalized, so we need to differentiate between different players. Uh, and importantly, the question you are asking is not what is your current capitalization, but basically what's your capitalization in some macroeconomic stress scenario out there. Okay, so our view of systemic risk that I'm going to present is going to be somewhat similar to this. Uh, in, in a stress test, you are really focusing on one adverse scenario. In our theoretical modeling, we are going to focus on a series of adverse scenarios and take averages across those. So if Bank of America in the stress test had a $35 billion capital shortfall under that one particular stress scenario, in our theoretical exercise, we are going to be looking at several such scenarios and whatever is the average of the capital shortfall of Bank of America across these scenarios will be its systemic risk contribution, which is how much undercapitalized will this institution get when we are in macroeconomic stress. That's basically our definition. So let me uh, just uh, sketch out uh, the uh, uh, sort of what the model looks like. I'm sort of rushing through, but I want to get to some of the empirical results. So I'm just going to sketch out the model at a very reduced form level, even more reduced form than what we have in the paper. So there are N banks, uh, there's two dates. At date zero, they make choice of investments and capital structure. They have some initial capital, which we just take as given. Uh, these institutions, when they choose their capital structure, they issue debt. Uh, some of these may be implicitly or explicitly insured by the government. The model is flexible to allow for different extremes. We don't assume any heterogeneity on this front, so we don't have any too big to fail problem in our setup. It's not the case that the implicit guarantee is higher for larger institutions, but uh, we could incorporate that in the setup if we wanted. Uh, they have. Uh, access to some investments. You can actually have different institutions have access to different assets. It doesn't matter in the model and they can save some cash. At date one, returns are realized. If returns are good, then equity holders or managers of these banks pay the creditors and keep the profits. But if things go bad, there's limited liability and they don't have to put up any further money. The creditors who are insured are bailed out by the government and the others uh, suffer the losses. So <coughs> in, in a simple setup like this, it's well known that there will be a risk shifting problem, which is that in general, if the starting capitalization is not very large, 
the institution may actually choose to take on high leverage and investment in riskier assets because of the limited liability option, which in this case is somewhat exacerbated by the fact that some of the debt is guaranteed and the firm doesn't pay the full price for its risks. So this is all standard. What is new in the setup is, the, is that we actually model in a reduced form way an explicit systemic risk externality. Okay? So the fact that each bank's shareholders want to take more risks because their debt uh, because they have debt or because the debt is guaranteed is really each individual firm level problem. There's no, nothing systemic about that uh, in saying that. But what we assume is that the systemic risk materializes as follows, which is that if you took the sum of the capitalizations of different institutions in the financial sector and say the total or the average of that was plotted on the x-axis, so this W1 is the random capitalization of the financial institutions as a whole, as a sector that's going to materialize in future scenarios of the economy, we assume that when that capitalization falls below a critical threshold W star, we say the system has become undercapitalized. And we assume that at that point, there is an externality from the financial sector onto the rest of the economy. What is the externality? We don't model it. It could be that there is some contagion risk onto others. We don't model it. It could be that they reduce their extent of lending, which is perhaps the most natural way of thinking about undercapitalization leading to a credit crunch. But whatever that is, we just assume that once the capitalization of the system goes sufficiently to the left, of this W star point, the cost imposed on the rest of the economy is linearly increasing in that undercapitalization. Okay? So now you can think about one scenario of the stress test that the Federal Reserve did as basically saying that you know, we have picked our scenario, we are going to simulate what the capitalization of the financial sector looks like at date one. Lo and behold, we are actually short by $75 billion, which means you are $75 billion to the left of the point W star. And the greater that number is, the greater is the systemic risk externality that the financial sector is going to impose on the rest of the economy. We, we assume this externality is linear rather than a convex form uh, because that allows us to get some closed form expressions for what is each individual firm's contribution. Okay. So this is basically the systemic risk imposed by the financial sector. It's based on when the capitalization of the system as a whole, not the capitalization of any one individual in institution, falls below a threshold level. Now, let's say you are $75 billion to the left of W star. You can ask the question, who contributed how much to that shortfall? And that then becomes that individual firm's contribution to the systemic risk under that scenario of $75 billion aggregate shortfall. Now, of course, in a model, you don't just have one stress scenario. There are several scenarios to the left of this point W star. So you need to average the capitalization shortfall of each institution in aggregate stress scenarios when the financial sector as a whole has become undercapitalized. Okay, so essentially the kind of measure we come up with on basis of this is something that looks like a tail beta, which is that you have to ask the question when the financial sector or the market as a whole is sufficiently in its left tail, what are going to be the losses that each individual institution makes on average in those scenarios. Now, <coughs> We show in the model that when you solve it all out, now there are two distortions. One is the limited liability distortion, which operates at the level of each individual institution. The other is the externality, which is that no individual institution is taking account of the fact that when as a whole they become undercapitalized, there is this credit crunch problem happening for the real sector out there. So we show that, uh, uh, you know, basically this model resembles a lot like a pollution model. Like this systemic risk externality is basically like the pollution produced by each institution when it undertakes risks. But the pollution is not based on each individual institution's choice. It's based on the collective choices of the institutions and their undercapitalization. So we show that in this uh, sort of pollution style regulation model, the efficient thing is to have a tax which has two components. The first component is just like a, uh, like a deposit insurance premium, which is that when each individual institution fails, it imposes a certain cost on the taxpayers because of the government guarantee, and you need to charge them for that, 
for, uh, for that loss which is imposed. So there is nothing collective or systemic about that component of the tax. But then there is a second component <coughs> which we call as the systemic expected shortfall. It has it is clearly proportional to this parameter E, which is really the slope of the line uh, on the externality. So E is basically the slope of this line. So the more severe is this credit crunch when the financial sector gets undercapitalized, uh, the higher is the taxation that has to be imposed. And the second piece which multiplies it is what we call a systemic expected shortfall and that is this measure which is the bank's expected losses in a crisis. Okay? So as I said in the stress test for Bank of America it was 35 billion dollars. In our model it's the average of the capital shortfall of Bank of America across these various states in which you believe the system is going to get undercapitalized. <coughs> so in a sense a bank's systemic risk contribution is larger if the extent if the systemic externality is more severe if the bank takes a larger exposure in an asset that experiences losses when other banks are in trouble that's why this is this looks like a stress scenario because you would believe that most assets that financial sector holds has at least some aggregate risk but if there are some assets like say mortgages or mortgage backed securities which are more systemic in the sense that they are going to lose their value when the economy goes down then banks which load up more on these kinds of assets uh, will be ascribed a higher tax. If the bank is more leveraged, there is a higher tax because if they start off with a lower capitalization, they are more likely to get undercapitalized in a stress scenario as well. And if these macroeconomic stress scenarios are themselves more likely. Okay, so <coughs> essentially you can think about this as th three components. The first point, which is how severe is the externality, that determines the size of the tax. The second two points are really about asset and the liability side of the balance sheet, okay? which is how much leverage you have. And second, are your assets highly correlated with the rest of the economy? So our tax is not just a tax on leverage. There is a tax on leverage, but the tax is also higher for those institutions which are holding assets which are more correlated with the rest of the economy. And the third component, so this is really a cross-sectional component, which is the capital structure and asset choices are what separate different institutions. And then the last point, which is how likely are these macroeconomic scenarios, you can think of that as a time series component. You might think that if you wanted to have a more counter-cyclical scheme, you should not really be adjusting the tax to be higher when the crisis becomes more likely. You should maybe just have some average over the cycle, etc. So in, the, in our empirical work, we are going to focus mainly only on the second and the third points, which is really the cross-sectional component of the tax. We don't focus on the level of the tax and we don't focus on this time series component, which is how severe are these macroeconomic scenarios going to be. In fact, you can think about the stress test as really being like a robustness approach in saying, so the Federal Reserve didn't ask the question, oh, how likely are these macroeconomic scenarios? They just said, these are the macroeconomic scenarios. Tell me what your capitalization is going to be in those states. Now, that is sort of like a robustness approach in the sense saying you want to ensure that you have a minimum performance of the system under these scenarios. In that case, the time series component becomes somewhat less relevant because you are always considering the stress scenario, whether you are in good times or in bad times. And that's one way of getting a counter-cyclical feature to your, uh, to your analysis. Okay, so in the remaining time, let me just explain, so how do we conduct our analysis? <coughs> So this tail beta that I was mentioning, which is how much are, go are going to be your losses when the system as a whole becomes undercapitalized, we need to operationalize this. The trouble is, if you are a supervisor, you can go and do the stress test because you can see the balance sheets of these institutions. But if you wanted to come up with some other measures which are readily available, you'd have to rely on some market-based data, but you don't see the stress scenarios in market-based data on every other day. So you need to do some calculations, but then make some adjustments in going from the normal time outcomes to the stress time outcomes. Okay, so let me just explain simply what we do. Okay, so let's say you were standing on 1st of July 2007 before the crisis began. In the 12 months prior to that, or two years, three years, as much data as you feel comfortable using, Take the 5% worst case days of the financial sector as a whole or the market as a whole. 
Okay, so let's say if you used one year, which is what we do in our analysis, you have 250 days in of trading. 5% of that is roughly 13 or 14 days. Take the 13 or 14 worst days of the market or of the financial sector. And on those days, average the percentage returns or the losses that are suffered by each financial firm stock. Okay. So essentially now we are doing like a stress test kind of exercise, but you are not going deep in the tail because you don't have those kinds of scenarios in your data. So you are sort of looking at a local tail, which is you are already in a pretty good situation in 2006, 2007, or at least uh, at that point you thought you were in a reasonably good situation. And you are just getting some 5% bad shocks around there. Okay? So now you get uh, essentially a local tail beta measure. <coughs> And then you have to think about if instead the market moving by say 2% on average on those 5% worst case days, if it moved 40%, how does this tail beta sort of translate over there? And basically you, we show in the paper that there's a leverage, leverage adjustment that you need to do, which is that if, so let me just give an example that makes this precise. If you have fidelity, it's just owning the market. So when market goes down, they basically lose whatever went down uh, in the market. If the market goes down 40%, they will just lose 40% uh, roughly around that. There's some flow of funds effect that could arise, but roughly that's what you share. So there's no leverage effect here. If you lose 2%, if you hold the index, you lose 2%. If market goes down 40%, you lose 40%. In contrast, if you have bear turns, in good times, if you get a 2% shock, bear turns will most likely just lose 2%. But if the market gets a 40% shock, because Bear Stearns is a very levered bet on some aggregate risky assets, Bear Stearns equity is going to get wiped out far more quickly than the 40% loss in the market. So the tail beta has this leverage component in it. The more levered firms are going to erode their capitalization even faster when you get these uh, extreme outcomes. So what, I'm going, what we do in the paper is to do three tests basically of this measure which we call marginal expected shortfall. So expected shortfall is the average outcome in your own tail. Marginal expected shortfall is the average outcome in the tail in this case of the market which is when the market as a whole is underperforming what is your average performance. Uh, some people like think that we pick this name because it can be read as mess. How much mess did you create? Uh, so this is your measure of the mess that you create when the system as a whole gets into a messy situation. So we do three uh, tests. The first test is actually to predict the outcomes of the stress tests. <coughs> so these are the 19 institutions. GMAC is excluded because it had only preferred stock and not equity. So we can't implement our measure. The column S cap gives you the dollar undercapitalization that was associated with each institution in the stress scenarios that the Federal Reserve System used. Tier 1 and Tier 1 common are their respective billion dollars of different the two kinds of capital. So one way of approximating the loss, we don't have more data on the stress test to do a better job, is to take the shortfall and divide it by your starting capitalization. And we do the same for Tier 1 common. And these institutions are basically ranked uh, as per that measure, uh, as per the S cap by tier one, which is sort of your loss relative to your starting capitalization. The rightmost columns are our two measures of systemic risk, as I said, the asset side and the liability side. So there's the mess, uh, and then there's the leverage of the firm. So the leverage of the firm is simply its assets divided by equity. You never have the full market value of assets, so we use book value of leverage. So it's uh, book value of leverage plus market value of equity divided by market value of equity. So it's just a simple measure of how much of your balance sheet is funded by, uh, by, by something other than equity. So you can see here that roughly the institutions that did have a shortfall are also the ones that have a high mess. So their mess is in, in excess of 10%. What does that mean? In this case, because we are looking at spring 2009, we calculated our measure as of Lehman Brothers, so using two years of data prior to Lehman Brothers. So this means that when the market was in its 5% worst case outcomes in the two years prior to Lehman Brothers, these uh, Bank of America, whose mess is 15.05, on average was losing 15% of its market capitalization. Of course, the leverage numbers are, are easy to interpret. You can see that both the dimensions, MES and leverage, at least in the cross-section, 
seem to be higher for the firms that had a shortfall rather than not. So here's a simple plot of this. Morgan Stanley, Regions Financial, Bank of America, Key Corp, Wells Fargo, were some Citigroup were some of the firms that had shortfalls. PNC Bank, uh, JP Morgan, they are all sitting at the bottom, State Street, they didn't have any shortfall and they had relatively lower mess measure out there. The second exercise we do is to calculate the whole measure prior to the crisis. So measure, do all this measurement as of 1st July 2007. Now the third column shows you the average mess. Of course, that's much smaller in 2006 or 7 because the 5% worst days of the market in this period were not that bad. So on average, the financial institutions were losing about 1.5% of their market cap when the system was in 5% of its worst case observations. Now, of course, if you look at the realized performance, which is in the demo period, which is from July 2007 until December 2008, that's much worse. The median firm lost 50% of its market cap and some firms actually lost it entirely. So what we are trying to do now is to try to predict this realized performance, which is your realized capital loss in the, in the crisis over an 18 month period, using this mess and the leverage measures that we had before uh, the crisis. So I'll just show you a couple of plots to highlight what kind of things happen. <coughs> so this basically is a plot of the realized return in the crisis using the mess in the one year prior to the crisis. There is a negative relationship, but it's, it's far from perfect as you can see clearly here. So which are the firms which are to the rightmost in the mess measure? Some names seem right. Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Bear Stearns, BSC is on right. But you see that there are a lot of exchanges out there. There's Intercontinental Exchange, NYMAX, uh, and so on. And this is basically the point I was trying to make earlier, which is that these exchanges are going to pretty much lose one for one when the market goes down. But because they don't have leverage, they are not going to actually sh losing as much of their market cap eventually as those other five investment banks I mentioned out there. And you see that in the next graph, which shows you the realized performance in the crisis as a function of their leverage. And you can see that now, basically, you have separated out those firms. Bear Stearns, uh, Lehman, Merrill, Morgan Stanley show up pretty high there. And now Fenny and Freddie show up there uh, uh, as well because they have extremely high leverages. So we show that a combination of this MES and leverage does a pretty good job. And you learn a lot actually as to which of these contain more information. So my rough intuition is that when you are in good times, leverage contains a lot of information about the systemic risk of the firm. When you are in bad times, you are already in the tail of the market. At that time, you can use market data to actually get a much better sense of who's actually more exposed to systemic risk. So when we run a horse race between our mess measure and leverage, we find that if you try to predict everything as of July 2007, leverage does a much better job. But when you're trying to predict the outcome of the stress test using data up to Lehman Brothers collapse, it's actually the market-based measure which is actually doing a much better job. Now, one thing I, I sort of uh, hid from you is the fact that this measure does terribly for AIG. So AIG is actually rated as one of the lowest mess firms, similar to Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, there are some explanations. We don't know which is the right one. One possibility is that we are using a market-based measure. Maybe the market didn't actually know the full mess they were going to create. Second possibility is that maybe one problem with using equity-based measures is that firms of the type of AIG, they are really selling deep out of the money put options to the world. So they are writing guarantees. In good times, they are actually collecting premiums and it, that actually benefits the value of the equity. But then when the bad shock arises, of course, they get wiped out because now they have to honor all these out of the money options that they have sold to the world. So the problem with equity measures is that it actually captures the upside as well and therefore may not have as good a predictive power in good times. So th what we did is therefore is to look at the credit default swaps data because a credit default swap on AIG is even in good times, it is not about AIG's upside. It's really about when AIG is likely to basically default. And so even in good times, it might actually have the right piece of information. And that is what we find. Uh, <coughs> Let me jump ahead. So this is basically the MES now on the X axis based on the CDS market and the realized widening of the CDS spreads on the Y axis uh, 
and you find that now you do a pretty good job and AIG now sort of sits in the center rather than all the way to the end. In fact, pretty much all the insurance companies who defaulted are picked up by the CDS data, but they are not picked up as well by equity data prior to the crisis. And we think this has something to do with the fact that equity is capturing upside, where CDS is always the price of your downside risk. So you see MBAC, MBI, which are at the top, were in fact two of the most troubled uh, monolines out there. Okay. Uh, so, so let me finish with this last uh, table. I, I'm sorry I've taken a little bit more time. Um, uh, this is basically like if we had to rank all firms which have credit default swaps data on them, there's about 40 out of the top 100 financials in the United States. Uh, you find that uh, when you rank them by their mess measure, pretty much you pick up firms that ran aground in the crisis. So you have Genworth, MBEC, and um, uh, uh, MBIA in the insurance. You have Vacovia, Citigroup, uh, and Washington Mutual in depository institutions. You have Selime, CIT Group, uh, and Fenny in the other category. And you have Merrill Lynch, uh, Lehman Brothers, and Morgan Stanley uh, in the broker-dealer uh, category. So it seems that with, when you use the variety of these measures, you do seem to pick up the firms that actually experience the greatest trouble in the crisis. OK, so let me uh, conclude. Uh, we basically developed a very reduced form model of a systemic risk externality. Our definition of systemic risk is the externality imposed on the system when it becomes undercapitalized. So the focus is on the capitalization of the financial sector as a whole. You can then measure each financial institution's contribution to systemic crisis by asking how much will it get undercapitalized relative to other institutions when the system does get undercapitalized. <laughs> it increases in the tail dependence with the economy, market, financial sector, and in the leverage. There's two final things. We are now extending the analysis uh, in a separate project to global firms. So we are looking at Europe, Asia, and we actually find that it actually does a right job even in Europe and Asia. And two, uh, for United States, uh, at, the NY at New York NYU Stern's Volatility Lab, we are now updating this measure of systemic risk on a daily basis. So you can actually get the ranking of systemic risk uh, contributions based on this kind of idea. It's built by Rob Engel, so it's more sophisticated than the measure I just described. It, it worries about dynamic volatility correlations and so on. Uh, but if you're interested in it for supervisory reasons or for research, uh, you can send me an email and I can give you a link to the website. We'll even be ha happy to share you the archived data uh, over time. Thank you. <laughs>